the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, the Cursed Plane, Triathlon, Comparing Reserve Destroyers, and Metal Beasts, the Most Advanced Fish Bed. The new update brought along plenty of new vehicles. So today we're going to tell you about the first Soviet third generation jet fighter from the top of the Soviet tech tree, the MiG-21 Biz, with a BR of 10.7. The Mikoyan Gurevich Design Bureau envisaged some enormous potential for future upgrades of this jet, even before it was finalized. Huh, small wonder that the most advanced modification, the Biz, is still in service in a number of nations. This jet is propelled by a turbojet engine with an afterburner. The fuel tanks are self-sealing, housed in the wings and fuselage. Its fixed armament includes a twin-barrel 23mm cannon with 250 rounds of ammo. The nose of the jet houses a radar system, and there are also decoy flares under the belly. Moreover, this machine can carry a hefty arsenal of suspended armament. Bombs with a caliber between 100 and 500 kilograms, S-5K and S-24 rockets, and four options for air-to-air missiles. The MiG-21 Biz is, first of all, a jet fighter, meant for achieving air supremacy. Its incredible dynamics, great climb rate, and high maneuverability will give lots of heat to any enemy in air battles. The R-3R semi-active radar homing missile is deadly, even on long distances up to 9 kilometers. Just remember that if you wanted to hit the target, you should keep your enemy in radar range. Another good option here is the R-13M infrared homing missile. This one doesn't require you to keep the enemy in radar range, but it can lose the target if the sun is in the back or if the target employs flares. For close combat, your choice is simple. The best option is the R-60 missile. Thanks to its ability to sustain 30G, it can hit even a highly maneuverable target. Once you're out of missiles, your 23mm autocannon comes in handy. A short volley would be enough to send the enemy back to the hangar screen. The MiG-21 Biss is no stranger to dogfights either. Its small mass makes it quite dangerous in a duel, while its powerful engine makes up for lost speed quicker than you'd expect. Just remember, it has an afterburner, so fuel consumption might become a problem. We recommend taking enough fuel to last 20 to 30 minutes. This will slightly reduce your flight performance, but will ensure you'll be able to finish a battle before the fuel runs out. As for mixed battles, your choice of suspended armament depends on the situation. If your allies have already achieved air supremacy, load up on those S-24s. Thanks to a ballistic computer, you'll be able to destroy up to four enemy tanks. If there are some enemy jets still on the map, consider a mixed set of four R-60 missiles and two S-24 rockets. Air-to-air missiles will help you clean the skies faster to make helping ground allies safe and quick. They were meant for each other the plane and its pilot. The plane was a B-17 with an evil tail number 12666 and a nickname All 666. Everyone who worked with it hated it. The nickname was well earned. In each sortie, something would happen to the plane, either Japanese AA guns or engine problems, or even a complete breakdown at the worst possible moment. The officer who saved it from being scrapped and later piloted was Jay Zima, a known troublemaker, daredevil and a misfit. He and his eight crew members were known as eager beavers, or psychos when they couldn't hear it, and with good cause. 
They volunteered for missions no sensible people would. What missions? Reconnaissance. But no ordinary patrols. Huh. No. This team of misfits was ready to go right into enemy dens. They would fly above the airfields and fortified positions on altitudes below six kilometers and photograph everything there. By the morning of June 16, 1943, when old 666 was getting ready to scout Japanese airfields on Bourguignville Island, much had been changed inside that regular-looking B-17E. The space reserved for bombs was emptied and defense weapons were installed. The change was justified. The Japanese knew Zima's plane by sight, so to speak, and chased it each time they could spot it. This time was no different. Once the plane had been spotted over Bourguinville, almost every fighter the island had took off after it. Seventeen newest Zeros were climbing as fast as they could. It would have been the best time to retreat, but that mission was a matter of life and death for thousands of US soldiers and officers. So the B-17 never strayed from its course and kept making photographs. The Japanese pilots realized they had finally caught their insolent spy and surrounded the flying fortress. The first three Zeros attacked from the front, trying to hit the cockpit. They knew that trying to attack a B-17 from behind was a bad idea. Imagine their surprise when the first attacker caught fire and dropped down after being hit with a forward-facing machine gun, with the second one promptly following the first. Thanks to the helping hand of Joe Sarnowski, the bombardier and nose gunner. Nevertheless, the third Zero managed to hit the nose of the plane a second later, injuring him and Jay Zima. The next enemy for old 666 was a heavy twin-engine fighter. We still aren't certain what plane it was, and there was no time for details back then, since a single shot from that plane's large caliber cannon could basically rip the B-17 into pieces. Sarnowski, bleeding profusely, got back to the machine gun and managed to down the enemy fighter at the last moment. That was his last act of courage. The rest of the crew, meanwhile, was bracing the enemy fighters. Zima sent the B-17 into a sharp dive, exposing enemy fighters to tail and waste guns. He steered wildly, putting the plane into a glide to leave no chance for enemy shells. When the Japanese had finally run out of their fuel and turned back to Bougainville, the crew learned that the battle lasted no less than 45 minutes, and it looked unbelievable for unusually fast-paced and short-air battles, and even impossible if you consider the odds. Their raked and barely controllable B-17 was crawling east. At that time, no one knew that their mission would break all records in the awards received by a plane crew on a single mission in the history of the US Air Force. Joe Sarnowski, the nose gunner, and Jay Zima, the commander, were awarded medals of honor, posthumously for Sarnowski, while the rest of the crew were awarded distinguished service crosses. As for the cursed plane, Zima was offered to choose any new B-17 instead, and he would take none of them, asking to repair his old 666. It was no accident when he chose that plane. Let us remind you, with the new power update, all vessels in War Thunder are now divided into two groups, Blue Water Fleet and Coastal Fleet. The Blue Water Fleet tree now starts with no less than destroyers. Well, it's time to check the pros you can use on the earliest ships for each nation. Please welcome American Clemson DD-336, German Type 1924 Leopard, Soviet Frunze, Town L-45 from Great Britain, IJN Mutsuki from Japan, and Turbine from Italy. The first stage, as usual, is a test of speed and maneuverability. Our contestants will have to reach a small rock, turn around it, and make it back as fast as they can. 
Let's go. The destroyers slowly gain speed, with the Japanese Mutsuki gaining lead and the British vessel lagging behind. Looks like the Japanese is already making a turn, with Turbine and Clemson closely behind. Leopard and Frunze are very close too, while the British vessel seems to be last. The turn radius is more or less the same for all of them, so no change in positions near the rock. Finally, the finish line. The Japanese destroyer comes first, then the Italian. The American comes third, while others were too slow to get round into the top three. Now let's check the armor and survivability on these vessels. In this test, the Soviet Project 159 will shoot HE rounds at them from five kilometers away. Let's start with the Leopard. It has six bays and a displacement of only 1,320 tons, which makes it pretty vulnerable even to single hits. Moreover, the German destroyer's crew is the smallest among the contestants with only 120 sailors, which means it loses its combat efficiency pretty quickly. The British ship isn't much better, but at least it has 141 crew members on board and seven bays like others. This fact enables the ship to last a bit longer. The American vessel shows a similar performance while the Italian one fares much better. The 12mm anti-fragmentation armor on its turrets can deflect some shrapnel. Finally, Frunze and Mutsuki can survive the longest, and it's thanks to their low silhouette rather than bigger crews or thicker armor. They're simply harder to hit, which makes them much more likely to survive longer. Finally, the third stage shooting. We've prepared two targets for our contestants, the SKR Groza gunboat, three kilometers away, and the Japanese T-51 torpedo boat at half that distance. Okay, let's go. Leopard makes three shots. Despite the raw power of its 128 millimeter guns, one salvo wasn't enough. The crew makes a quick reload and finishes the target. Meanwhile, the Soviet, Japanese and Italian crews have already destroyed it and started firing at the second target. Clemson only manages to sink Groza with a third salvo, while the British crew seems to have a problem. One main caliber gun is clearly not enough. The Frunze crew report about their success first. Having four rapid-firing guns help. The second to finish is Mutsuki, and the next to finish are the Italian and the German destroyers almost simultaneously. The British captain commanded to bring all guns into play and finally sank both targets thanks to the AA guns, which enabled it to catch up with the opponents. The last to finish is Clemson, probably very upset with town and the whole test. Okay, let's sum up. The audience choice goes to the British ship for the ingenuity shown on the shooting range. The third place goes to the Italian Turbine for its good mobility and weaponry. The second place is awarded to the Soviet Frunze for its low silhouette and rapid firing guns. Finally, the winner today is the Japanese Mutsuki. It has the best survivability and speed, and it also carries 12 torpedoes in addition to guns. Well, now that the winners receive their awards, it's time to answer some of your questions. The first question was sent by a player called Anthony Feliciano. How can you use the M60 effectively? Hi there! The M60 is a well-balanced machine capable of employing all sorts of tactics. Its high mobility will allow you to get into important positions earlier, or retreat from them, which is just as important. Its good armor will save you from some AP shells, while its powerful gun with Hesh and Heat FS rounds is efficient against most enemies. Try your hand at different tactics with it 
since such balanced machines are the best at helping you find your preferred playstyle. Daniel F. asks, Can you please explain the ricochet table for tank rounds? Yes, I can. Hi, Daniel. It's fairly simple. The angle of your hit is based on the perpendicular dropped onto the armor plate. The smaller the angle, the lower the chance of ricochet. The opposite is true, obviously. The bigger the angle, the higher the chance. Another question comes from Caesar Sean. Is there a method to turn off the flight instructor without going into full real controls? Hello. Yes, you can turn off some flight instructor functions if you go to Controls, Aircraft, Instructor. Drez Worthy writes, I was wondering if you could explain why the bottom half of the big ships are colored red. Hi there. This provides a higher contrast and makes it easier to find any damage otherwise hidden by the water. And the last comment for today was written by Onyx Wolf 345 Which modern MBT do you have fun playing? <laughs> Hi there. We like playing all top MBTs, but if you want something special, we go for the STRV-122B PLSS. You don't even need to join a battle. Just take a look at the thermals rising. We can do that for hours. Yep, you guessed it. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4pm GMT or noon Eastern Time. Don't forget to subscribe and click that bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Also, don't forget to leave a like as well. Share your thoughts and comments and see you next week.